All right, guys. Hey, we're back. 1039 LI News Radio 941 The Bud Orlando, Florida, the King of Rock. 94 countries WNAP radio.com. Last segment we were talking with my friend John Costello. His new book, Executive Hoodlum. Negotiating at the corner of Maine and Mean. You can get it if you go to executivehoodlum.com. Or just go to Amazon.com. It's getting these incredible reviews. Hey, John, you ever know that uh, you'd be such an effective writer, dude? You know, it's funny because I wasn't intending on writing it at all. Um, and then when, uh, as you're aware, uh, my, my good friend Larry Elder, who's a you know, best-selling author and has his, uh, you know, a, a, I think it's nationally syndicated radio show, um, you know, he was originally going to write it, and then it was clear after being in a few meetings and writing sessions and he interviewed a lot of the people that are mentioned in the book as well. But he, you know, he's from South Central Los Angeles, so he wasn't really familiar with Chicago street slang or any other the vernacular. And after that, it was clear that I was going to have to have to write it. So, you know, I, I decided that, well, I'm just going to tell this. I'm just going to tell a story. So my goal was to have people hear my voice when I'm reading it, because it's, it's me telling a story reads more like a novel than a true story. And, and some of it, when you read it, it's going to seem surreal because people are going to say, this is impossible for all these events to happen or be surrounded by, you know, one guy. So I think if I read it myself and not having authentication like I have on you know my website or all the documents that I dug up when I did the fact checking and, and got the timelines correct, I probably wouldn't have believed it myself. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, I mean... Anything from meeting, you know, me hanging out with celebrities at the man, you know, at, at U Hefner's, uh, to my best friend being a celebrity, you know, it's, it's something that was a, not even a, you know, not even something that would even remotely cross my mind as a kid, you know, growing up in Chicago. Yeah, uh, and it's crazy too because one of the things that that you talk about in the book is that you talk about growing up poor. Now, a lot of people who think that uh, you're surrounded by this life and stuff like that they they see the sopranos they see aj uh you know aj mm -hmm. uh, could want for nothing and um mm -hmm. uh, you know what was it like to to grow up poor with all this stuff happening around you you would think uh, from the outside it might be different what do you say to those people well you know what it, it, it was, back then it was very different because being poor then it was very obvious to people in other words if I went to the store to get milk or bread I had to go there with actual food stamps and when you're in line and paying for something with food stamps you know this is at the digital age you get some pretty nasty looks from the you know the cashier from the people in front of you the people behind you you know like hey you're some type of you know a deadbeat mm -hmm. uh, you know we were on we were on welfare for quite a while because my father had I had another family who was treated a lot different. They were leave, you know, they were, if you're familiar with California, they were living in the, you know, the nice suburb of Encino up to where the, you know, the the uh, rich people live. And you know, we were down in the, you know, in the in the, uh, you know, in the West Valley, uh, and not such a great um, area. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. My father wasn't your, wasn't the the prototypical guy mob associate that you would associate with any of the movies you see who actually are very protective over their families. In other words, we, we felt like we original three were expendable, and I think a lot of that had to do with so psychologically, because every time he saw us, he remembers what he did to our mother, and he remembers the guilt. So it was almost like he wanted to, to, to push us away because he already had a new family. In fact, when we moved in with him, unbeknownst to us, he already had three other kids, and what, got, what hit me hardest, which caused a lot of resentment and hatred in my end. And one of the things that helped me to drive to drive myself to success was one of the younger kids I met that he had shared my name. Mm. So when you feel you're expendable and that you'd already been replaced, once again, as a, as a third, you know, looking at it as an adult, you probably say, mm, brush it off, you know, move on. But, you know, your mentality as a 13-year-old kid is a lot different, right? right? right. You, you know, there's maybe insecurities there. You just lost the parent, and and now all of a sudden you've been replaced. So yeah, I, I'd say that was a 
a, a thing that really got me red hot, but I was scared to death to say something because then I'd have to take a beating. And right. I took enough of those, and I didn't need another one. I just figured <laughs> I'd bide my time. I'd get out of there, and sooner or later I'd, I'd, I'd walk away and, and not look back. And you, you talk about challenges, and, um, you know, you had uh, so many of them growing up. And uh, there's another gentleman that I was speaking with uh, who I'll tell you about later. Uh, I'll probably rerun him later. I'm talking about uh, Gunner Allen Lindblom, who has a great story. I'll tell you about him uh, later, Johnny. Um, but one of the things that you tried to do is you tried your best to try and hide the family's perceived criminal behavior because you are a smart guy and you wanted uh, to advance in the, in the, in the white collar uh, with your white collar uh, colleagues. Um, right. What was that like? I mean, trying to almost live two lives uh, to cover up with one, make excuses. I mean, uh, tell me what that must be like, man. Well, there's some pretty good examples. Of I think the biggest issue was my father and I shared the same name. And if he, he, he periodically, if it suited him, would use my social security number. Oh my so a lot of times anything he did would show up with me. But um, uh, as, as it pertains to some of the challenges, I give you a perfect example. I'm trying to work my way up the corporate ladder. I just got promoted to uh, director of global sales. And, um, you know, we, my, my sister had recently been on a, you know, a talk show. I think it was Lisa Gibbons or Montel or Geraldo. One of them with uh, Antoinette Giancana, who's the daughter, you know, known as the Mafia Princess, the daughter of Sam Giancana. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that gets out, and since the names are the same, and, and you can see these, these clips are on my, on my website, you know, they say loud and clear, John Costello, a.k.a. this, a.k.a. this, a.k.a. this. <laughs> but, of course, when John Costello gets out there, and all of a sudden, it's, you know, it's guilt by association. Uh, I, I went out, after I graduated college uh, back in 83, I was, I was going to buy my first car from a friend of mine that, that actually I went to, to college with. And he was running the credit check. And, of course, the, the guy comes in and he says, Hey, John, your records indicate that you're incarcerated. So, <laughs> apparently, while my father was in prison, uh, you, know, he, you know, he had used my social. And somehow it ended up you know, notifying them that the social security number you know, was not uh, the part of the working class. It was the part of the incarcerated class. And, you know, I had to look at it and go, well, look at the year. It says I was born in 1938. Do I look that old? <laughs> so, you know, that's one of the things. And I guess, the, you know, the topper was when I was, um, we had uh, a worldwide uh, sales meeting. Actually, a, yeah, a global sales meeting scheduled at our corporate office. And um, it happened to land on a specific date. And uh, I was actually served a federal subpoena. Uh, by a federal prosecutor in St. Louis to show up and as a hostile witness to testify against my own cousins oh my in a RICO trial. So that was a hard one to explain to the CEO that hey, sorry, I can't make the yeah you know the the salesman because the federal government says I have to do this. Oh my god! And that's god. a whole other story in itself. <laughs> so yeah, yes. it's, once again, one of those crazy things. In fact, I think the, the copy of the subpoena is on my website. So if you you see it, you'll you know it's, it's right there front and center. That was a yeah, that was, that was a, a tough one to, to get around. So it, it's those types of things and more that, you know, that, that, that have you, you know, having to deal with the, uh, that part of your life and at the same time trying to pursue the career of keeping that stuff a secret. And at some point, you know, it had to come out, especially these days when I handle government relations. So I deal with senators and congressmen and other bureaucrats. And, um, you know, I have to, you know, I, I, I fully disclose because I, I'd rather hear it from, have them hear it from me than to find out later, hey, do you know that that guy that you were just with, his father did this, 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 and this? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? So, it's, yeah, it, 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 you know. But yeah, honestly, to tell you the truth, writing the book, it was very liberating. Because once that's out and then you don't have to hide it, it, it it's honest to God, it's liberating. It's like, you know what, I don't have to hide this anymore. And, in fact, as a sales guy, I, I realized I could use it to my advantage because, remember, I, I was dealing with a bunch of engineers. I mean, enough, life doesn't get more boring than <laughs> electrical engineering when you're, you know, I'm from the streets of Chicago. So if I'm going to see a customer and they can tell them a little bit not myself, you know, they started asking me. Finally, I just said, well, here's why I'm not myself. 
and I'll hand them, here's the subpoena I got, right? Or here's the thing I got to do. And then to them, it was probably the most exciting thing they'd certainly seen that year. So it was almost like a reality show, and, you know, every time I'd visit them was the next episode. Mm. So they would prefer to see me because it, they started living their life vicariously through my messed up life. Right, right. I mean, uh, why <laughs> yeah. not? Why not? I mean, you know, when, when, you, when you're dealing with, with something like that, why not want to hear from the guy who's got a, a bunch of stories? I mean, it's, it becomes down to personality. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of it is. Yeah, it, it's, they it's, like. Yeah, so yeah, so like I said, when you realize, and, and once again, it was is very, you know, when you finally realize that those people were going to accept you, no matter you know where you were from, because they've known you long enough, you've established yourself in your career, then it it it, it truly is a, a monkey off your back. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really cool. I'm not sure if you said this in the book or if this was a quote. By the way, guys, I'm speaking with the great John Costello. Uh, an old friend of mine, and he's the author of the new book, Executive Hoodlum, um, uh, Negotiating on the Corner of Maine and Mean. And you can get it at uh, executivehoodlum.com or just go to amazon.com. You said, uh, I'm not sure if this is from the book or a quote somebody got you at, but you said, I believe there are experiences in your life that shape the way you think and act as well as how you handle adversity. My experiences tended to be on the extreme side, whether violence and death and criminal record of uh, da-da-da, uh, my experience with blah-blah-blah, or over the, uh, the Fortune 100 executives, politicians, and other bureaucrats deal with these days. Um, how do... How do how can you wear so many hats and know what to say to so many different people? It, it just it boggles my mind because you've done so many things and uh, so many different groups. Uh, you identify, most people just identify with one group, but here you are, you're all over the place, man. Yeah, it, it's kind of odd. And um, yeah, that was probably from the notes from an interview. I, I didn't, that's, that's not necessarily in the book. It's probably something somebody would take from the book as a. Uh, you know, kind of actually, that's, for, that's from that's, actually that's from a review from uh, Amazon. I see right now. Okay, yeah, that's from a review. Sorry gotcha. about that. I didn't mean there was. Yeah, I mean it's certainly, you. yeah, it's certainly a past less less traveled. And put it this way, you know, you, you know, you have street instincts, and you have the the city that calls you back to the neighborhood. And, and, and there's something to be said. You, as a guy that's been in New York, I mean. You, you, it's, it's very true what they say. You can take, you know, the boy out of the city. You can't take the city out of the boy. Um, and I, w- I would characterize it that because it's very hard to turn your back on your family and even your extended family. And it's a, it's a very thin line to walk, and you got to know where you where, where you draw the line. And, and that was a challenging part because it it became very very stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, learning those things the hard way uh, probably helped me in my career because there's a lot of things I learned from that in terms of, uh, of, of of being able to handle myself in the business world because then, you know, deadlines and, 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 and meeting numbers and stuff like that on a quarterly basis for a publicly traded company, I think that stress level pales into comparison to the stress I was feeling outside of the workplace. Mm-hmm. So I, I would say that, and I guess this is, this is, now this is a line from the book. Dealing with criminal families, drug dealers, outlaw bikers, outfit guys, wise guys, certainly prepared me for working, you know, with the government. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it truly, you know, some of the things I see, I shake my head and said, boy, my father did five years for that. You know, and this guy's walking around like nothing ever happened. So, yeah, that. There is an irony uh, there, but, yeah, I, w- I would have to say that, you know, um, whereas I wouldn't recommend that, mm. um, you know, to turn it in, to, 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 to try to walk that line can be challenging. Um, but once again, it's, it's, it's my street instincts that, you know, that, that tell me I, I, yeah, I, I can't turn my back. Certainly not on family. So, um, you know, I, I would usually just disclose, for instance, a perfect example and I'm not using any names, but I got an email from um, the wife of a guy that was going about to, to be sentenced. 
and she requested that I write a letter to the judge on my company stationery um, indicating that they should show leniency or whatever. And so, once again, uh, you're in a situation where I had to bring that to the chairman of the board of the company and said, look, what do you want me to do? I go, if I don't do this, I can't step another foot in my neighborhood ever. Mm -hmm. If I do do this, this could be detrimental to my career with the board of directors. What do you want me to do? And so those are the types of situations that, once again, they're, you know, I'm sure the chairman of the board of most public companies isn't faced with that type of question from one of his top executives. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, but like I said, those are the types of things that, that happen, and you have to kind of wiggle your way um, uh, around them and try to deal with them the, the best possible way, um, you know, without, once again, without crossing a line. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it, it they'll get balanced, to say the least. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, throughout your career, uh, you've you've been someone who you kept your nose clean, and um, you know you you rose to be so successful in business, and um, you know you've you've helped and um, educated so many CEOs, and um, you know uh, you're you're at the top of your game. I mean, you know I know what uh, what you did. You talk about in the book. I mean. Uh, I could brag on you for for hours about what you, what what, you, what you've done in the business. Do you talk about? I mean, do you tell the audience exactly what you've done? Because I can do it. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I'll yeah. I've, I've kind of put it this way. You know, I started as I was never a white collar guy. I was, you know, I, during the summers I'd pump shingles up a roof and you know, I'd be hoisting hot tar up on you know, a, a three story building in Chicago and. And I was accustomed to, 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 you know, to showering afterwards, not before work, you know, and wearing a tie and dealing with yuppies. I mean, it was it was a culture <laughs> shock. And the transition of trying not to use street slang or swearing or, you know, using profanities around the, uh, you know, the workplace was, was, was fairly challenging as well. Um, but once again, it was, a, it was certainly an adjustment, uh, adjustment period. I worked my way up traditionally. I, I started on the you know, on the bottom, you know, I was a, this, this company I'm with now is I've been there with thir almost 30 years. I uh, started as a sales engineer and then went through a series of promotions uh, to become, the, you know, the vice president of, uh, of government relations and business development, um, you know, for a now, which is a, you know, basically a, a $20 billion, you know, publicly traded company. So, um, yeah, it, it, it does have its challenges, but there are certain things you learn in the streets um, that really help you in the boardroom. And I can give you a perfect example of me being the, on the wrong end of a sit down <laughs> where I'm trying to explain to some outfit guys that I didn't steal their money. My father stole their money. <laughs> um, you know, when you're in it, when you're under extreme duress, your words say one thing, but your body says, I mean, you, you will typically tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of tells that these guys, like, you don't think you're walking out of a meeting on your own feet. You know, whatever you say better match with your, your, your body language or you're in for, a, you know, a harsh surprise. So when I walked out of that sit down after my father stole that money and I had a, a guy tell me, hey, Johnny, you're off the hook, but I can't guarantee anything, you know, for your father. Well, later on, we became very good friends. He actually offered me a job on his route, you know, basically collecting uh, protection money from a specific neighborhood. Uh, that's when I learned a lot about body language, what, mm -hmm. how people act, what they do. We, you know, we, I've been on, when I went with this gentleman to other sit downs, uh, on being on his side of the, the fence, I was able to observe how people react when they're under that duress. And I brought some of those lessons to my negotiations or in the boardroom with people and just watching their mannerisms as we spoke and negotiated. And I could walk out of me and say, you know, I don't trust that guy. And that's, here's why I don't trust him. Wow. Here's why I think he's not telling me the truth. Here's why I think this deal isn't what what he's he's claiming it to be. You know, outside of doing your diligence from a legal standpoint, once again, there's something to be said about about body language and learning that. But once again, if you have to put that person under a specific kind of duress and know what to ask um, in order to get the truth, so you know, so those are some of the lessons that I took from the street side to apply them, you know, to the business world. So. Um, once again, I don't recommend that part of the <laughs> curriculum, you know. But uh, but let's just say that, that that I learned quite a bit from some of those street 
tree guys. I, right. I, I got to say, brilliant. That's brilliant, man. I, I got a friend out in uh, Lake Forest up there. He's a business coach. His name is Steve Smith. Uh, I, I could see you guys, uh, you know, doing something together because you got so much to give to the business world. I mean, you're you're you're, you're such a smart guy, and you you. I mean, this book right here, guys, Executive Hoodlum, uh, negotiating on the corner of. Uh, Main and Mean, get it at executivehoodlum.com, get it at amazon.com. My guest today, uh, John Costello, uh, an old friend of mine. Uh, it's a blast from the past. I'm so glad to reunite and to hook up and uh, to learn what you're up to and didn't know you were such a great writer, and uh, this thing has taken off, and I wish you the best. Uh, John Costello, definitely one of the world's most amazing people. Thank you, buddy. Hey, KT, thanks for having me, my friend. Let's get together soon. Uh, I would love to do that, man. Uh, next time you're in New York, but uh, I won't say nothing because I don't. I, I don't know if I want to be uh, in, in the same meeting uh, around. Here. I'm totally. I'm totally kidding, John. I'm totally kidding, man. You're, you're, oh, that's you're, funny. So, so you doing? You doing some? Do uh, you got any signings coming up? Or, or uh, well, it just just came out. So I guess you're planning them now. I guess right. Well, yeah, I just got back with the publicist because, as you know, I I, I signed that other. Uh, you know, that other film deal mm-hmm. and I'm trying to align things because I, I, I don't know this world, you know, this, 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 this stuff is really, really foreign to me. So you're in a medium I don't understand. So I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to roll with the punches and take your, take, take your direction. Yeah. But just like anything, you'll learn it and you'll become the top just like you have been. So guys, my guest, <laughs> Johnny Costello, my, uh, my friend, I will speak to you soon and God bless buddy. Thank you. 1039. LI News Radio 941 The Bud in Orlando, Florida. 94 countries, WMAPRadio.com. Thank you for listening. We will see you same time tomorrow. Good night.